my name's Grant Britton, and I'm a photographer. Uh, I guess I'm a skate photographer, but I shoot other kinds of photography, too. I worked at the Del Mar Skate Ranch. I started working there in 1978, and in February of 79, I borrowed my roommate's camera and shot a roll of film and got it developed and, and just kind of started up as a hobby like everybody else. I didn't really take a class for probably a year and a half or so and just shot a bunch of black and white because it was cheaper but had no way to look at it, had no money to print it, had never worked in a dark room. So I was just shooting photos and just trying to get figure it out because I didn't know what f-stops and shutter speeds were and there was no internet to look at. You know, you couldn't watch YouTube videos and, and uh, I don't even think I had a photography book. I would just ask other photographers what was going on. But I, but I worked at the skate park for six years and uh, I ended up as the manager. When I first started, I was just, you know, serving Cokes and sweeping bowls out and skating with my friends and meeting people and, and uh, I just was shooting you know when a pro would show up I'd just run out and kind of shoot in the background I wouldn't say hey do this hey do that because um, I didn't I wasn't sure of myself you know I was pretty shy in 1980 81 I was going to Palomar College which is out in San Marcos and I was taking art in general ed and then one of my friends Sonny Miller who was a photographer skater he goes, hey, you want to take your negatives into the dark room and uh, we'll print something. And so I took my, brought my negatives the next day and we met up in the dark room and I knew nothing. I, I had never developed anything, a roll of film or a print. So we went in and I, I printed one of my pictures. I, I don't know which negative I printed, but as soon as I saw it come up in, in the bath, I just went, oh my God, this is amazing because it was art. It was technology. It was everything just rolled into one and you could get everything really fast. You know, you could take a photo and then you could go in the dark room and print it, you know, that, that day. So, yeah, I, uh, the next day I went and dropped. I had three art classes and I dropped all my art classes and enrolled. I crashed three photography classes. And these are the film days. This is all film. And I got into shooting uh, a lot of medium format and, and 35 and then a little bit of 4x5. So it just, you know, it's like everybody's story, you know, you just start out as a hobby and then, but right when I went in the dark room, I go, this is what I want. This is what I want for myself. And back then there was Thrasher and no other skateboard magazines. And like I say, there was no internet. There was no way to get your artwork out there, your photos out there. But I knew I wanted to do photography somehow, whether I thought I would be a fine art photographer or landscape photographer. In 1983, Larry Balma came to me at the skate park. I was working, and I'd had maybe six photos in um, Thrasher, just sent them photos. Whenever they needed a, uh, a photo from down south, they would call me, and they, oh, we need a photo of Gator or Billy Ruff or somebody like that and for Thrasher. So I would get a little photo and get a photo credit, and I was all stoked that I got a photo credit. And then Larry Balma came to me one day at the skate park, and he... He asked me if I'd submit to this newsletter he was working on. He owned Tracker Trucks. And I go, yeah, sure. So I gave him a bunch of photos. And then, you know, a while later, he called me up. And he go, hey, you want to come up to my office and see the newsletter we're working on? So I get up there, and I see this 40-something page magazine on the wall, you know, pinned to the wall. This is before computers. You know, and I looked at it, and I go, wait, this isn't a newsletter. This is like a magazine. He did the magazine, they brought it into Transworld, and we were all or into um, the skate park one night, and we were all looking at it, and we were just laughing at it, because it was so amateurish, and it was, you know, skate and create, and um, be good, be good, and it was kind of the antithesis to Thrasher, what they were putting out, you know, skate and destroy, and, and you know, party, and the whole thing. So um, after that, like we were looking at it and I go, I'm not working on this thing anymore. I'm not giving him any more photos. Then he hit me up again and he wanted photos for the second issue. So I gave him photos, you know, because it was, I always say this, it was the only game in town. You know, there was nothing down in Southern California to work on. And I'm just starting out, you know. So 
I've been shooting for, you know, three and a half years maybe and not, you know, I never made any money on it. Uh, I don't think I ever got paid for a little ad or anything back then. So then I just started working on it and uh, eventually I, I set up a dark room at Transworld in Oceanside and I started going up there every day and then I would work the skate park. For a year I worked there and at the skate park and then I quit my job in 84. He started paying me. Well, first I was getting 200 bucks a month <laughs> and then I was working at the skate park too. And then I was still, I was still doing, I was do, before we had the dark room, I was doing everything at Palomar College. I was running everything through their dark room and the tech would just give me a look like everything was coming through the dryer. It was fiber based paper and it's coming through the big circular dryer. And he's just like, he knew right away what was going on, you know, and I just kept doing it and developing all my film there, printing other people's pictures there. And then we opened the dark room at, at Transworld and that's when I was, I had pretty much taken everything I could take at Palomar and I stopped going there and just started working on the magazine full time. And so I worked there for 20 years from 83 to 2003. Well, you know, when, when it was all film and then it went from 35 into, um, I think Atiba, when he started shooting with the Hasselblad, that's when everybody had to get Hasselblads, you know, and you had to get that six thousand dollar fisheye you know and and uh because you're working with fast flash sinks and you know and with the leaf shutters and the Hasselblads it was just it was cool but then digital I remember the first time I used digital and there was a contest in Oceanside and I was just like I don't want to go and shoot all these sequences with film waste a bunch of film be in a crowd you know you're just like I don't like to shoot in crowds. I kind of hate it. I don't mind being up on the ramp, but when I'm out and about, it's just like, I just don't like events that much. In the 80s, it was okay because there was nobody else. It was me and Mofo and a few other photographers, you know, Bryce, uh, Knights and Chris Ortiz and a few other people. And you had the best seat in the house and um, that's why I liked it. And everybody knew each other. And then when skating started to get big and other people, you know, the X Games or whatever took control of it, you were just a number. You were just one of the sheep, you know, that they wanted. Okay, you got to stand here and shoot your photos. We know you're, you know, they would stick, try to stick you in a box and stuff because it was for TV. And, and uh. so this event, I borrowed the snowboard magazine had a digital camera, like a what was it back then? One D, probably. And so I took that camera and I shot sequences all weekend with digital camera, and then walked in on Monday and told Dave, you know, just Dave Swift, dude, this is a godsend. You know, it's it's like we don't have to waste any more film and digital. You know, sequences. The photos are only this big anyway. We shared a camera. You know, if he needed to shoot sequences, he would use that camera and I, then I would use it. And then we shot still for single photos, you know, we still shot film. We were shooting Hasselblad. 35 millimeter, probably nobody was shooting 35 stills at the time. You know, everybody had switched over to a Hasselblad. And so then we started shooting digital sequences with that camera and it just... My, my, my film bill, you know, I was sending film to all the photographers and my film, you know, like we were shooting mostly Velvia and then uh, 400, like Tri-X or probably T-Max by then. And uh, shooting some 3200 was pretty popular for sequences at night, you know, because you could turn your flash way down and then just shoot it, you know, uh, push the film like 6400 or whatever we were shooting at. And so that was popular. Yeah, digital just took over and I encouraged everybody to switch over for sequences, to switch over to digital, just because it saved the magazine a lot of money. You save money on the cost of the film, which was like, what, eight bucks a roll back then. And then to get it, to get it processed, it was like probably seven bucks a roll. So we were just wasting so much money. And uh, the accountant loved us because my film bill just went down. 
And that's when we were having, we had a lot of pages in the magazine. Transworld got up to 400 and something pages at one time. It was like Vogue magazine, you know, a thick Vogue. So we saved a lot of money. My bill went down from, you know, thousands of dollars in film to probably hundreds of dollars in film, sending film out all over the United States to certain photographers who worked for us. Uh, Being a photo editor, you're always trying to save money somehow because your print bills are just, you know, crazy, you know, to print a magazine. And then you have, you have issues that sell well and issues that don't sell well. So back then when we switched over, there were a few photographers younger than me that wouldn't shoot digital because they were like, oh, the quality's not there yet. And I'm in arguments with people half my age. You know, shouldn't I be the old curmudgeon that, screw, screw digital, I'm only shooting film. You know, I needed it as a tool. You know, for me, it was a tool. It's still shot photos. Sequences aren't high art or anything. They're just documentation of a trick. Now you have video. But I would get into heated conversations with people much younger than me. And I'm just thinking, aren't I the one that's supposed to be on the other side? You know, because there were a lot of guys my age who didn't switch over and it ended up kicking them in the ass, you know, where they lost business. It just cost so much. And then when they finally switched over, you know, the quality got better and better. And these guys finally switched over. They started tweaking their photos so much. I was like, well, now it really doesn't look like film. Because they were always saying, doesn't look like film. It doesn't look like film. And when they started tweaking it, you know, they were desaturating or over sharpening and, and making it look kind of whacked out, you know, or then the um, HDR. Yeah, it was like ridiculous. And they're doing stuff like that to it. And I'm like, wow, now it really doesn't look like film. When I shoot digital, I came out of the film world, so I always want it to look like film. I don't want it to look too sharp, because images can look too sharp. I mean, with a Hasselblad, you've already got a sharp, sharp image. Even my digital stuff now, I barely sharpen it at all. I sharpen it a little bit, you know. I mean, I have to do Photoshop on stuff, because straight out of the camera, it just doesn't look that great, you know. But I always hold it to that film standard, you know, where it's got to look like film. It got to where we couldn't run a lot of vert skating because people hated vert. Because back then, like, street skating was, you know, 95% of skateboarding at the time. And we would run, we would get a letter, and it was like a hate letter about too much vert. And then I would go back to that issue and count, and there would be, like, one page of vert. And you were getting hate mail out of one page one photo or two photos you know it was like ridiculous i mean it's it's like trolls now you know back then trolls sent letters <laughs> and then once in a while i would actually call, i would trace the person down and like if they if they contact if they wrote a letter and it was a really shitty letter and just attacking us or whatever i called people up before i go hey yeah is this uh, john yeah this is grant britain at, at trans world and there's just like uh, yeah, uh, you know, where you just, it was so funny. And I would have to like call information because I'd have, I'd have their, sometimes they'd have their address or the town. I'd look at the postmark and then I'd just look them up and, and I, I probably did it twice, you know, but yeah, I actually contacted people and like, now you would say, you know, people don't expect like personal interaction with somebody, you know, they, I'm just going to write this hate mail and they just get away with it. And then you feel like crap because you're reading this thing and you're like, what does this person do? Really? Do they do a zine? Do they do, do they skate? You know, you're just, we do a magazine. You know, we put out a magazine every month and we've done it for years. You know, a lot of people just don't, that doesn't click on all the hard work you put into something, you know, and then they don't do anything. You know, they don't do anything in their town. Do they get a skate park going? No. Do they, they just complain. You can't have a thin skin, like doing a magazine or whatever, you know, or a TV show or anything. You can't have a thin skin because people, there's people that are just, they're, they're just mean, you know. People have said such mean things to me and I'm like, I don't even know you. I, I'm addicted to books. And I love photo books, art books. I mean, I read a lot. I do think that with print, it's 
you see all these photos that are taken on phones and which take great photos. People shoot, you know, digital photos and they never do anything with them. They never print them. Um, then a hard drive crashes. I think making a print out of a photo gives it that extra validity that it was good enough to make a print of it and to collect prints. A lot of the photos I sell, you know, online are photos I shot 30 years ago. And it's like a photo of, of Tony Hawk or Chris Miller or uh, Nottis or somebody like that. Because skaters are older now, they have money, finally, you know, because they didn't have any money back in the day. And people go, oh, I had that photo on my wall when I was in high school, you know. I hear that all the time. And, yeah, do you have any photos like that, you know? Well, I have that photo that was in the magazine. So I think making prints, it, it takes pe people back in time. It's like this time machine. It's, it's like a book. It's like somebody spent all the time to make this book. You know, it's like this book, this John Van Hammersfeld, 50 years of photography. He made this book that's got all his photos in it and art and, you know, everything that he did over the last 50 years. And it just has this value, you know, this added value that, that social media doesn't have, that, that the Internet doesn't have. You forget everything, you know. I can't think of a lot of images that I've seen only online that I really remember. I use inkjet jets. I don't do them myself. I take, I take everything to a lab now and get everything done. They have an RA processor, like this big thing, and it's silver chemicals. So it is, it's an actual photograph and it's archival. And then anything big I have to do on an inkjet there, like on ha ha honey mule paper and some other papers. Um, I just look at it, it's all photography, you know, but at least you're making a print of it, you know, and when you can do big prints that you couldn't do in a dark room, really, unless you were putting it on the wall and, and using, you know, your enlarger, you know, like that, but um, I'm just open to everything, you know, I love everything to do with photography, Polaroids, I've, I've you know, done it all, I was, I wish they made Polaroid Type 55 you know, film. I love that film. You know, where you get a negative, you get a black and white positive and a negative, and that was unreal film. You know, the Polaroid film right now isn't that great, you know, from what I've seen. I really got into uh, quick loads and ready loads, because, you know, by just sheet film one at a time, it was so easy to use. And I don't really like loading, going in and loading film, but Polaroid was great. I love Polaroid. And I've done the giant Polaroids too, like, uh, I'll show you later. Um, but I did the 20 by 24 Polaroids too. Okay. I, I used that camera a couple of times. I've shot some of my favorite photos with not that great a gear. Like I have a, uh, through college I had a Mamiya C3 twin lens reflex. A couple of those photos I shot are some of my favorite photos, you know, and I bought it for three lenses and that for 450 bucks or something back then. Gear is just, it's like a race driver. Is it the car or the race driver? I think the gear is the, the, the most minimal part of it. You think of like the most famous photos of all times, they weren't taken with great gear. I mean, they were a Leica, but they were like, they were good lenses, you know? The box that the lens is on, it's not really, it's no biggie, you know? Leica bodies, like, it's just a body, you know? I think the lens is probably the most important part. Hasselblad is just a box. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just a machine, you know? It's a tool, you know? It's a hammer. I'm not a good carpenter. I can hit with the hammer, but I'm not a good carpenter. You know, you put a hammer in the right place with the right person, and he creates, you know, a house or a piece of art or whatever. I think it's mainly, you know, the person. That's Todd Swank, and I drove by this thing every day. It was in Del Mar near the skate ranch. I would drive to go get coffee, and this this wall was there, and it was under the freeway in Del Mar. And, uh, and it's just the light coming down between the south and northbound lanes. I shot it, and then David Carson was the art director 
at, at Trans World at the time. So we went to the magazine Trans World, and I was the photo editor there. He's the art director. Sat in a group of people, and we go, we want to run this as the next cover of the magazine. So this is 1987. So everybody hated it in the group because they looked at it and they went, he's not a pro. They looked at it commercially. It's not guy in the sky, you know, color. It's... 1987, there's no day glow colors, there's no logos on his board showing. They, they just thought about advertising, you know. So the guys, but the big thing was, and he was my assistant too, on top of it. And so got in this giant to do about it. And uh, oh, and we didn't want to run any, we wanted to run the name of the magazine and nothing else on the, on the cover. Got in a big fight. I ended up leaving for a couple of days and I was, I was like, I'm quitting. I'm, you know, I was like, fuck this. And then Larry Bama got in touch with me after a day or so. And I went in and they ended up running it on the co cover, which was like a surprise. You know, it was black and white. It was everything that broke the rules. And it's this guy doing nothing. He's just skating. He's just pushing. We all do this. I did it as this is every man, this is every skateboarder does this. So yeah, we, we ended up using that cover and it, so when the magazine came out, half of the people hated it. Half the skaters hated it. They just didn't get it. They didn't, they were like looking at it and going, what are these guys doing? And then, but then, you know, the other half seemed to love it. And then over years, like I was talking about the time thing, it, it's become one of the better known images in skateboarding. Well, in skateboarding, I learned by looking at the photographers from the 70s that, that worked for Skateboarder Magazine and, and, uh, and Wide World of Skateboarding or whatever it was called. Uh, but I looked at, you know, Stesic, Craig Stesic, Warren Bolster, uh, Jim Goodrich, Ted Terrebone, William Sharp, oh, James Casmus, the guys that came before me. And then when skating died toward the end of the 70s, they all left. Uh, Jim Goodrich still shot some photos and Stesic still shot photos. They all left and then I kind of came in right after that. Mofo that worked for Thrasher, me, and then he brought up Bryce Knights, you know, was his assistant. and. Um, and then I brought up a few people. Yeah, and then my peers, like Mofo, I would always, you know, Mofo and I were the main photographers in the late 80s, or mid to late 80s, and uh, I would always look at his stuff and i go, what would Mofo, you know, I would always kind of see what he was doing, and I'd, it was a one-up thing, and I'm sure he, maybe he cared about me, I don't know. Yeah, I was always look at Thrasher, and, and that would keep me, like, going, you know, like trying to outdo them you know I was trying to do a totally different magazine than than they were I was trying to do kind of like really good photography we were on better paper a magazine that other photographers would want to be in just because of the quality you know of it um, non-skate photographers well like my peers in skateboarding you know now you know I think about my peers too you know like a Mike Blayback and and you know how would he shoot this you know so I look at people like him for inspiration too and looking at people like Gaberman and, and that shot kind of weird and back in the 80s, you know, with Sturt, you know, Dan Sturt was probably the best photographer, skate photographer that ever has lived. He just, you just don't see anything by him anymore because he quit shooting. Non-skate photography, really, it helped me with my skate photography. Like I said before, it's, I learned photography through skateboarding. So when I started learning about other kinds of photographers, I brought that into the skateboard photography and I took, you know, a studio product uh, photography class and, and that helped me, you know, with my skate photography and it helped me with lighting. I took everything I learned from the studio and I took it into the streets and into the skate parks, you know, where to put my lights, you know, because when I started shooting, it was flash on top of camera at night. That's the only time you could shoot a flash because the, the shutter sinks were so slow. I had a Kmart flash. My first flash was a Kmart flash. It was called Vocal, I think. And then I got a Vivitar, you know. And then I got a Sun Pack. And, and then, you know, and then I got Q flashes after that. And 
Now I shoot, you know, a, a Chinese splash. Mainly I'm working on my book and it's because uh, uh, in 2019 it'll be 40 years. I started in 1979 with my first skate photo, my first photo pretty much. And uh, so that book hopefully will come out toward the end of 2019. So it'll be 40 years of, of skateboard photography.